Hey folks, Quilly Teen here and welcome to the start of a brand new Let's Play slash tutorial for RimWorld. We're going to do something we haven't done in a very long time here and play a completely vanilla game of RimWorld, not even with any expansions, no mods, no expansions. Uh, playing this uh, in August of 2022, it's on version 1.3 and change, uh, but everything we do here should apply to later versions most likely, as well as I'm playing on PC, but uh, the Steam or the console release should be fairly similar in gameplay as well. Obviously the user interface will be different, but the mechanics should be the same. So if you are new to RimWorld, hopefully this will be one for you. It's not gonna be a super long Let's Play, but we're gonna go and you know try to develop a pretty decent base with this. I'm going to try to explain what I'm doing along the way um, in a way that's appropriate for new players, although I will try to keep up a relatively decent pace as well so we can actually get the gameplay. Anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and create a new colony. There are a variety of different scenarios that you can choose from, including the ability to make your own custom ones. Crash landed is absolutely the de facto experience for RimWorld here. Three survives should off, start off with. Um, really nice balance, really great. Uh, the Lost Tribe can be fun, but being primitive really hurts your research rate but you do start with more people. Rich Explorer, you only start with one person, um, which is really hard, but you do get a little bit of extra tech to start off with, and then Naked Brutality is super duper mega hard because you start with nothing. You're completely naked. Uh, definitely a big challenge, but yeah, we'll just go ahead and go crash landed over here. Next thing, you gotta pick your storyteller and your difficulty. Uh, Cassandra Classic is indeed the standard storyteller for, you know, that the game is sort of balanced around. Phoebe Chillax is not easier than Cassandra Classic. The events that you will have in Phoebe Chillax will be just as difficult as Cassandra Classic. However, you will have more time between events over here. So it can be a little bit more chill to build up, but when you do get an event, if you haven't prepared for it, it can be quite shocking how difficult the event can suddenly be with Phoebe Chillax. And then Randy Random is, well, random, it's a whole other thing. I'm gonna go with the standard Cassandra Classic, and then after that, you have to really pick your difficulty setting. Um, when you go to Peaceful over here, there's really not gonna be much in the way of bad events or attacks or anything like that. In addition, you get more out of your farm, you get more resources and that sort of thing. It's a very nice and easy way to do it. And you can go all the way to losing is fun where things are indeed going to be super hard. You can also customize the difficulty if you're specifically looking to tweak some things. I'm just going to go with the baseline strive to survive over here, right? Sort of, well, I was going to say middle. I guess it's not middle. There's six difficulties and this is the fourth one over here. So a little, a little more than middle. Um, I think this is probably the most classic sort of difficulty setting over here. Uh, you can also choose whether you're playing in sort of a hardcore mode where you you, the game just auto saves and you can't back up at any point. Reload anytime, you can make multiple saves. You can reload whenever you want if something goes wrong. We'll just go ahead with that. That's gonna be okay. I'm gonna create a world over here. Um, you can make a world that is, you know, 100% generated, but there's really no need to do it. I don't think it slows down the game really once it's running. It takes a little longer to make the map, but it's so not necessary at all. I'm just gonna leave everything as is. The seed here, this is, um, if you want the same world twice, just use the same keyword twice, and it can be whatever you want. <laughs> I don't know if I want blood. That sounded, that sounded scary and dangerous. Anyway, we're gonna go ahead and just generate the world. It'll just take a little bit of a moment. Yeah, and again, it will take longer if you generate a bigger world. But the thing is, this is only, yeah, so 30% of the world generated here. Admittedly, yeah, there's a lot of ocean that's not generated. This is still a tremendous amount of land over here. Uh, I've never felt like there was any shortage of space with this. We're gonna go ahead and pick our starting area. We can go anywhere from like these ice sheets over here, which are super difficult, as well as, well, there's tundra, there's desert. There's also going to be extreme deserts in here somewhere. I can't remember what color they sort of show up as. And that's arid shrubland. Oh, we might not have an, an extreme desert available right here, oh, which is interesting. Um, you know, obviously those are gonna be a little bit more challenging, you just expect um, more heat, fewer trees, harder to farm, that sort of thing. Generally speaking, your more straightforward starting places are going to be these temperate forest areas over here. Uh, they're not gonna be too hot, they're not gonna be too cold, there should be a decent amount of trees for you to use as various materials and they're not bad. Um, there's also these little stony areas over here. So this is a temperate forest, but that has large hills. You can just see down here, as opposed to this over here, which is flat. Oh, hills have various pros and cons to them. Um, you know, hills and mountains take longer to dig through, but 
they can lead to more secure bases. They can also be a little bit more interesting. I'm going to go ahead with either a small hills or a large hills start for us here. Let's go with this large hills one. Um, being close to roads can be quite useful because you will be able to move around the world map a little bit faster, but ultimately it's fine. I like, you know, we're going to have a few neighbors. We got a few couple of dangerous neighbors over here. We've got a uh, friendly neighbor. Well, we might stay friends with them. We might not. These are people we are going to be able to trade with potentially. Um, the little uh, triangles here, the little tents, these are primitive tribes. So they will have um, they will have less sophisticated goods to trade, but they're still very handy to have neighbors. In fact, it might be quite useful for me to pop into the middle here and we'd have maybe more trading partners. Although these two, I'd have to cross a mountain to get to them. So I'm just going to pick this. It's going to be fine. We're going to be a OK. You can click advanced and get a few more options about your starting setup. The game does not recommend you playing on these large maps because it kind of will break some of the pathfinding optimization, do some wonky stuff in there. Um, the default is this medium map. The slightly bigger medium map is totally valid to play on, but you don't have to worry about it. You can just ignore that. That's going to be OK. We're just going to go ahead and hit next. And here's the most important part of your start. You know, picking your initial like starting area, I mean, it makes a big difference certainly, but to me, the biggest and most important thing is who your three characters you're gonna start with at is. So what happens with the standard start, the game generates eight characters for you, but you're only gonna be bringing three. You can take a character, and move it up. So now I've got Phoebe, Jake, and Silva. I'm like, you know what? Never mind. I don't want Silva. I want Vort. So I'm going to do this. Or you know, I can I can reorder all kinds of things as much as I want. But these are not these eight are not the eight characters you are limited to taking. What you can also do is with these characters is you should just re-roll them. We can just keep randomizing the same character over and over again uh, until we're happy with whatever we've got. Now, how do you pick your st or starting characters? What are you looking for? Well, first of all, some characters are incapable of doing certain things, and that's going to be a result of their background. So Sky over here is a labor camp orphan. As a result, she will not do art. And she, as an adult, she became an herb world enforcer. As a result, she is not allowed to do research. Now, in addition to these things, oh, and she's not allowed to craft drugs either. Um, in addition to these, these backgrounds will give them pluses or minuses to various skills, depending on what the background is. Um, and you can see their current skills over here. Skills in RimWorld go from zero at the bottom to a maximum of 20. Anyone with two digit skills, they're very good in that skill. Now, your starting pawns aren't very likely to have two. Wow. OK, there, Vort, you're pretty incredible at medicine and, and intellectual. You're pretty smart. What about Phoebe? Yeah. So, so, you know, single digit there. You double digit is nuts to start with. It's it's a very, very, very high number. I don't necessarily look at the raw number as much as I might look at these little flames over here. This represents that a person, a pawn, these, these characters are often referred to as pawns in this game, your pawns in your, in your colony. Um, a pawn that has a flame next to a skill has a passion for that skill. So by default, every time you do something, you, um, you gain some experience points in that skill. OK, so if we were to assign Vort here to cooking, every time they would cook a dish, they would gain some experience in cooking. However, if they don't have any passion for it, you can see where it says learns 35 percent. That means they only get 35 percent of the experience for having done that task. So they're only going to learn this task at one third the rate of what you'd expect. If they have a flame of passion here, they learn at 100 percent the default rate, which means someone with a flame learns a skill three times faster than someone without a, uh, a flame or, you know, someone without a flame learns it one third as, as slowly or, or, you know, whatever you want to think about it. Double flame is they're very passionate. They have a burning passion and they learn at 150 percent. Now, that's obviously really good, but the jump from no flame to at least a flame is the important one because the double flame only learns 50 percent faster than the single flame. It helps. It's a big deal, but it's not, you're not, you don't have to be stressed about the burning passion, but you don't want someone who's got no passion in something, uh, and especially a low skill to do a certain job. Like you, we really don't want Vort to do cooking. Now, sometimes you'll get characters that have a high number in a skill uh, that they don't actually have passion for. It can happen because of their background or something. Well, there you go. Here's an example. Silver over here has nine points in animal, which is 
quite good, but they don't actually have passion for it. Um, this, this, the, the thing is, this is quite a good number. You could certainly use Silva here as one of your animal tamers if you wanted. But the ideal really is to give it to someone with passion because not only will they level up their skill faster, but they'll actually be happy if they're working on something that they're passionate about. So that's great. Now, with the three people you have selected, the game does give you a handy little um, total down here. This shows you the highest skill you have in any particular category. So right now, we don't, of our three people, we don't have anyone who's particularly good at cooking. Our best cook is Phoebe, um, and they don't have any passion for it because it doesn't have a little flame there. It's possible, it's possible that say Sky or someone, someone could have a skill, a cooking skill of zero or one, but be passionate about it, which means even though we're not starting with anyone who's good at cooking, they could at least learn pretty quickly. You can use this as a guide to know how easy is your start going to be? It's certainly not going to be great. Where our food situation is going to be quite poor if we don't have anyone who can plant plants and cook food very well. That's unfortunate. Also, construction is a very important job early on. A six isn't a terrible number, but the fact that they're not passionate about it is kind of disappointing. So what you might want to do is, you know, keep checking and make sure you've got, you know, at least one person who's at least OK in most skills with only three pawns. It's unlikely that everything will be perfect, but, you know, it would be nice if there was a little bit more. The other thing is you really might want to take a look at this incapable of section over here. Um, dumb labor being incapable of that can be quite annoying because that person can't haul or clean, but it might be OK as long as they're they're going to be really busy otherwise. And actually, Vort's kind of a good example of this. Not being able to haul or clean is really annoying. But on the positive side, they have a lot of skills they're quite good at. They will always be busy doing something else. Crafting is something you can basically be 100% busy about. And intellectual research is perfect. So basically, Vort's never going to carry something around, but they'll always be researching text, if nothing else. So that's actually pretty good. You just want to make sure you don't have too many people that are incapable of too many things, because that would be quite poor. So Thieb here is not a great character necessarily. There's a few things they can't do. They don't have any high skills. Um, although construction is pretty important and crafting is pretty important. They got passion. So yeah, our best crafter has a six, but Phoebe does have a passion for construction. So that's okay. The, the next thing you do want to take, uh, pay attention to is their health to see if they've got anything that is particularly problematic. So Jake over here is addicted to go juice. So, um, if we don't have any go juice, which is like super caffeine, basically, then, um, they're going to be very unhappy. Eventually the addiction might go away, but. It's going to be rough. Um, there we go. Silva over here has an artery blockage in their heart. They could die of, of a heart attack at any point, and then you'd lose a pawn, which would be annoying. Um, Shizuka here has a wooden left foot. They've lost their foot at some point, so they're going to be quite slow to move around. Scars aren't so bad, but they do tend to, they can slow the pawns down or make them worse in certain categories and can leave them in some amount of pain as well. The worst ones to worry about probably are like, if someone has like a bad back or is frail, that's going to cause you huge problems. So ideally, you don't want anyone to start with any significant health problems. As it turns out, none of these people have any health problems that have got selected. The last thing, and perhaps, in fact, the most important thing are the traits, but I wanted to save it until last because it's kind of a complicated topic to address. Each one of your pawns will spawn with a certain number of traits. I think in normal vanilla rim world, three is the maximum, but you might have people with fewer. So Vort and Sky both have two traits. Phoebe has three. Some of these traits are incredibly helpful. Some of these are neutral or, you know, they're both good and bad, and some of them are just real bad. So. Phoebe here is kind, which is nice. They have uh, they have better conversations with people. They never insult them. They tend to make other people happier. This can be a really nice trait to have your pawns get together pretty well. Bloodlust sounds like it's bad. It's interesting that this person is kind, but also gets a rush from hurting people. I don't know. Everyone needs an outlet. Bloodlust is actually a really handy trait for you to have because Phoebe, if Phoebe gets into a fight, right? If there if if there's a battle, if we get attacked and Phoebe kills someone. Phoebe is going to be happy about that. They're also not going to be as bothered by seeing dead bodies and things like this. Phoebe is going to be a solid person to have in battle. And the fact that Phoebe has a burning passion for shooting and melee means they're going to be a great battle pawn. Phoebe, bloodlust is a great trait to have. On the other hand, very neurotic is very tricky to deal with. Very neurotic gives you a huge boost to work speed. Phoebe is going to work faster than everyone else but their mental break threshold is higher, so they're more likely to snap and cause problems if they aren't happy. 
Very neurotic is a, is certainly a risk, although I think Phoebe is nice enough that we're going to keep it anyway. Um, here's another one of some interesting traits. Great memory is good. Naturally, um, the higher level a skill is, if they're not, they, they will, all your pawns naturally over time lose some of the experience they have in their skills. They sort of forget their skills. So if they're not constantly working on something, then they will over time get worse at it. So for example, Vort over here, if they never do any mining, their mining skill was, will actually degrade over time, which makes sense. With great memory, that doesn't go down as quickly. So it's... It's a positive trait. I don't think it's a significant trait, but it's a positive trait. They're also a psychopath, which again, not necessarily a bad thing because not being bothered by some of the things that happen in RimWorld can actually be incredibly helpful and useful. Um, there's just, Vort's just gonna be bothered by fewer things. And that's actually probably fairly handy. Uh, Sky over here is a slow learner. Now this sucks. So look at that global learning speed factor minus 75%. So if we look at the mining over here, so Vort or sorry, Sky over here is burning passion for mining. So learns at 150%. However, because they're a slow learner, their base value is, is only 25%. So it doesn't matter if Sky has passion or something, they will learn very, very slowly, which is crappy, but I think I'll bring Sky anyway. Um, and Sky is tough which is good because she will take less damage in combat. So it'll be kind of tough, or, well, will be tough. And I guess that's gonna be useful, sure. We're gonna go ahead and get started. And yeah, again, I'm playing with just core, no expansions loaded whatsoever. All right, so here is the start of where we are. So for the very first time, we're gonna see our map. I'm gonna hit a space bar to pause the game right away. So we're dropping in an area. There's There were some resources on the ground already, and then in our little drop pods, there were more resources. By default, a lot of this stuff is marked as forbidden. This little X over here means our pawns aren't allowed to uh, interact with it. And the reason they do that is because in case you're on a tough map or something, they don't want your pawns by default running across the map to go and you know interact with some sort of items. But we really are going to want these things to be unforbidden, to be allowed, so that we can interact with them. So we're gonna go into the architect mode over here. We're gonna go to orders, and you can see this allow command over here. We're gonna go ahead and just uh, select all this this whole area. We're just gonna uh, box select, and everything is now allowed. The other thing you can do is you can right click on the allow button and unforbid all items. So there are other things on the map that had been uh, forbidden. There were 19 other things on the map somewhere that were forbidden. We went ahead and allowed all that so that we can use them. Generally speaking, that's probably what you're gonna wanna do when you get started. You're gonna wanna take a look around the map, you know, take a take a, your bearings over here, see where you might wanna set up your base. I mean, typically you're gonna wanna set up kind of in the middle of the map, like what we've got over here, you know, so we're sort of in this area, it's nice and centered, good place for a base. The other thing you're gonna wanna look at is uh, how defensive an area is, because at some point you will get attacked unless you're playing on the lowest difficulty. And actually, I really like the starting location because we've got this whole mountain behind us that's going to be natural protection. Um, diagonals over here, no, people cannot squeeze through this diagonal. Although if you're worried, you can put a little bit of a wall right there and then you'll feel like you're very, very sealed in. So if we went and just put like a wall kind of around here, we'd have a big area over here to work in, which would be wonderful. Uh, the other thing to consider is if there's any rich soil around. So rich soil will be a little bit darker. Um, we can also toggle on the fertility. This button over here will show you fertility of an area. There's a bunch of rich soil over there and over here. Rich soil is much better for farming in. Um, if it's a little close to the edge of the map, I mean, I, we could decide to claim this area as our base area, and then we'd have a great farm over there. But you know, this is fine. So this is not rich soil, but it's perfectly fine to grow stuff in. I'll probably be happy with that. And then maybe, maybe as we go on and our base expands, I'll probably grow in this direction and actually maybe just fill in this whole area here. And then we'll have a really great little farm area um, but I'll probably just keep things fairly close to start off with. So I'm going to toggle off the fertility overlay, um, and we've got that. There are these little chip chunks that have landed in a few places. These can be deconstructed for a little bit of material, so they're actually quite handy. I'm going to deconstruct you and you over here because it's going to be close by. Excellent. All right, so let's fi figure out what do we want to do first? Well, we need to make sure we've got the very basics down. Basics would include shelter, food, and security. 
Um, and really, actually, I guess food would be the first priority in a sense. Um, but you know, you know, can get built at a bit the same time. Let's take a look at our three pawns and figure out what we want them to do. So this is the work tab over here. These are where we choose which labors are enabled for each pawns. Um, by default in the game, what it does is it enables, it looks at your, your three starting pawns and whoever's got the highest value in a category, it turns on that skill for them. So Phoebe has the best cooking skill at a two, which ain't much, but it's better than a zero and it's better than a one. So it was turned on for Phoebe. Now this doesn't always match up with passion. For example, we remember Sky has the construction of six. So construction was turned on for Sky, but Phoebe, while he only has a four, Phoebe has some passion for it. So it actually would probably be better for Phoebe to go and do the construction. Yeah, they'll start off a little lower, but they will get better. So I might want to turn off for turn it on for Phoebe. I may want to turn it off for Sky. Or of course, I could turn it on for everyone if I wanted to. The red squares over here is a hint that these people are particularly bad at doing these things. So you may or may not want them on. Um, you can, and in fact, almost everyone plays with manual priorities put in here, where you can prioritize tasks from one to four. Task priorities one are done first, then it'll try priority two tasks, then three, and then finally priority four tasks. Jobs are always done from left to right as well. So even if you don't use manual priorities, or if you use manual priorities, but you leave everything at a three, which is the default number, they'll always attempt to do firefighting first, then they'll attempt to lie in a medical bed if they're hurt, then they'll attempt to do medical work, then they'll try to rest, from their diseases and so on. And the very last thing they'll attempt to do is research, assuming that's even turned on. Um, if I did something like with Vort, if I told Vort to put a mining at a one and say a craft at a two, Vort will first see if they can mine, then they will see if they can craft, then they'll come over here and try firefighting, etc. If I have two things at a one like this, Vort will try mining first, and then if there's nothing to mine, Vort will attempt to craft, and then so on until they go down the list of priorities. Um, what I tend to like to do, and if you shift click a column, you can do the whole thing. I like to set firefighting, patienting, doctoring, bed rest, and basic all to a one, because I'm always, almost always gonna want these things to be done absolutely before anything else. Sometimes the doctrine gets tweaked a little bit because for example, it might be in Vort's case, it might be more important for them to doctor rather than firefight or even um, uh, be act as a patient themselves if something comes up like that. Although the doctor will override a few things along the way. For now, we'll do this. And then what we can do is we can change this as a case by case basis. That's gonna be perfectly okay. For now, what I'm gonna do, we're, we don't care about wardening right now. I'm just gonna go ahead and turn that off for the moment because we don't need it. We'll turn off animal handling. I'm also gonna turn off cooking. So I am actually generally a big fan of having proper cooking right at the start of the game. Um, other people really like to set up a nutrient paste dispenser right from the start of the game. I prefer the uh, proper cooking so that we can get some better moods right away. But in this case, because my cooks are so terrible, this is gonna be an obvious choice for a nutrient paste game. So we're gonna do that. I'll also turn off hunting for now until I figure out what I'm gonna do with that. Now, construction, okay, Vort would be particularly bad at constructing. And then we've got these other, actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna turn all these off so we can talk about how I might wanna look at things. One of the things you generally want to do in this game is you generally, as much as possible, want to have a pawn focus on a specific job so that they can max out their skill in that job. It's it's better to have one pawn who's gotten their skill up to 10 rather than two pawns with skill at five doing the work. So if you can focus on some uh, someone on something, it's ideal. And of course, you want them to focus on something they're passionate about. So for example, looking at these, I'm going to say, okay, for construction, Vort and Sky, Vort is bad at construction. Sky would be okay for now, but doesn't have passion. Certainly Phoebe is the person I'm gonna wanna have construct as much as possible and develop as much construction skill as possible. Um, Smithing, Taylor, and crafting is another one where skill matters a lot. Now Phoebe has some passion for that, but Phoebe might be busy constructing. So I'd rather Vort really focus on the crafting job over here if they can, so that, um, they get really skilled in that. Although there's a bit of conflict with research, which we'll have to figure out a little bit later. Um, and then with Sky over here, well, obviously they're gonna be quite good at mining if that comes up. And well, what else? Well, okay, wardening, if we do have a prisoner, then Sky's obviously gonna have to be responsible for that. So I'm gonna put those at a two. And that's what I tend to like to do. The things I would like them to become experts at, I like to set those at a two. And then for things that I'm okay if they still do, if there's nothing else going on, let's say a three. So Phoebe, I don't mind if you do some crafting. 
over here, some smithing, tailoring, and crafting. Um, if you don't have any construction to do, because you'll you'll have some passion for it, and that's going to be okay. Uh, same thing with Vort. What I could do is put the mining at a three. You know, if there's nothing to craft, then maybe you can help with mining. We'll see that. Sky over here. If there's if we don't have any prisoners and there's nothing to be mined, they're actually going to spend their time hauling and cleaning. Hey, you know what? I can't complain about that. The problem with this is it doesn't leave anyone to do growing and plant cutting, which obviously has to be Sky's job because literally Phoebe and Vort cannot do it because of their traits. And planting food and cutting down plants is actually a very critical and important job. So even though Sky is only a skill three and doesn't have passion for it, I'm going to have to do this, but I'm definitely going to be on the lookout to see if we can capture or recruit in some way another pawn that hopefully has passion for for plant work because that would be incredibly helpful for us. In the meantime, our food might have to mostly come from hunting. So I'm sure we're gonna be enabling that, but we'll look at that a little bit later on. And if we are gonna be hunting, that means we're gonna need to do butchering, which is part of the cooking job. Um, but luckily you don't really need a ton of skill to do the butchering. So we could safely turn on one of the cooking for one of these crappy people, if not all of them, so they can just butcher things that get hunted. And then we'll just put that meat into the nutrient paste dispenser uh, so that no one actually has to cook a meal. All right, so that's not a terrible setup. Uh, again, we'll have to figure out something with research here because there's a chance, I mean, we're gonna want Vort to do a fair amount of research. Most likely, in fact, what I expect is we're gonna end up with this um, with Vort. In fact, I'll put the mining out of four. So if we don't have a research table, so if there's nothing to craft and we don't have a research table yet, Vort will help out with mining if there's any and might become completely idle as well. Well, we'll deal with that relatively soon. But as soon as we've got a research table, Vort's always going to have something to do. They'll either craft something or they'll research and Vort's just going to be busy forever and it's going to be wonderful. OK, so that's the work sorted out. Let's figure out our initial sort of food situation and um, um, and shelter and security. If we had anyone who was good at planting, I definitely set up a lot of farms. I think we're going to still set up a farm to get, I mean, if nothing else, to showcase it. Uh, and then it will be one set of food. Luckily, in a temperate forest here, there's generally going to be a lot of good things to hunt. So we'll do that. Let's go ahead and pause. They'll move around. They'll do a few things. Actually, who's our best shooter right out the bat? We click on a pawn. Check this. So skill four, skill five, skill nine. Okay, Sky, I'm going to tell you to equip the bolt action rifle. And I think you're going to have to be our hunter if you're not too busy. Um, Vort's got a skill of five, but Phoebe does have double passion for shooting and bloodlust. So I'm going to give you the revolver and then Vort, um, you're going to give you the knife. You don't have a passion for melee, but I'll equip that. Those are all the weapons we've got right now. So we'll get them to go ahead and equip those. And yeah, we'll almost certainly have to do some hunting early on. And what I might do, Vort's got a melee weapon. We don't want them to hunt, but the other two really, I could give them a fairly high priority hunting job. And that's not a terrible thing. They won't do anything until we assign anything to be hunted. I will set up a tiny little farm early on just to give us an option. So I'm going to go to zone over here, go to growing area, and I'm just going to put a little farm just somewhere arbitrarily uh, over here. I'm going to make a little five by five farm. This is not very big. Um, and we've got to pick a crop to grow to start off with. The basic food crops are corn, potato, rice, and strawberry. Now, strawberry does have a minimum skill, which we don't currently have. So if I sign this, I'll get an error or a warning. Hey, you can't actually grow strawberries. So nothing's going to happen over here. The advantage of strawberries is you can eat them raw and not make people unhappy. No one minds eating a raw strawberry. There's always a chance you can get food poison from eating raw food. It's pretty small, but it might happen. You know, there's just there were bugs on a strawberry or a little bit of mold or something like that. So some people can get food poisoning from eating raw berries, but they won't get a bad thought from eating raw strawberries. Well, they will get bad thoughts from eating raw rice, potatoes or corn or raw meat. Of the other three, though, these these other crops, so strawberries don't actually they need skill and I don't think they generate as much nutrition per crop. Rice, potatoes and corn basically will all generate the same amount of nutrition from a particular farming plot. The difference is how long it takes for them to grow. Rice plants grow very quickly. So you get less nutrition per harvest, but over the course of the year, 
rice, which grows very quickly, and corn, which grows very slowly, will give you the same nutrition. Corn grows very slowly, but gives you tons of nutrition when you do get around to harvesting it. Rice grows very quickly, but doesn't give you as much, and potatoes are in the middle. Potatoes also uh, get impacted by the fertility of the ground the least. So if you've only got some pretty crappy terrain, potatoes are going to uh, not care about that as much. They'll be fine. On the other hand, if you're going to be growing things in very fine terrain, this rich earth over here, potatoes won't really benefit from the rich soil. Instead, you're going to want to or rice or corn. Now, potatoes, there's a reason potatoes are set by default um, when you set up a farming plot uh, because they are so sturdy and they're in the midpoint in terms of growth time versus nutrition. Rice plants give you more consistent food because they come in so much quicker, but they do take extra labor because you're having to replant them more often. It's probably not a bad idea to get a rice crop set up as your first crop though because you, it will turn around faster and you'll get some food a little bit sooner and just get it tr trickling in long term i mostly like to have as many of my fields on corn as possible because you don't have to replant them that often they, they, they take less labor but because there's such a long period of time between harvests, sometimes you can run low of food in between harvests. So you need a bit of a buffer there. In practice, a mix of different crops is a pretty good idea because they've got different timings. Um, also, they'll be more resistant to blights that might happen. You can see Sky over here is chopping on the trees because they're in the way of this uh, farm plot. You can also go and ask them to specifically chop down some more trees as well. If I go chop wood, I can say, you know what, let's chop all these trees because I'm going to be building a base here. Plus, I might want some wood. So I'm going to say, please chop down these trees. So Sky, who has sent the plant cut, well, first she's going to try to grow and then she will do plant cutting jobs. So she will eventually come around and chop down all of these trees. Let's get some shelter. When night comes, we are going to want to have a place to sleep. So I'm going to build a house. The pull down menu over here shows you all the material you currently have access to. So wood, steel and silver. Now it tells me I don't actually have any wood. That's what it's the little red text over here. It's a little hard to see because it's hidden behind things. And the number is red over here. And if I mouse over there, you see not enough stored. There is wood on the map. There's 57 wood here, 52, 55, 46, but it's not in a storage stockpile. So the game is telling you you don't have any wood stored. That doesn't mean you don't have access to it. Um, so I'm going to build a little place for us. Um, now, how big do you build these things? There is sort of a kind of a maximum practical size. Um, if things are too far away from a wall, you can't build a roof. And that distance is, we'll say about six tiles, which means that in practice, a room that, a wall that's like this, let's say I go 13 by 13 by 13 by 13. This is an 11 by 11 interior space, which means the middle tile of this room, which is actually technically right here. So this this right here is the middle tile. This is only six tiles away from a wall, which means all of this is going to get roofed up. So this whole place would get a roof. If I built a room bigger than this, the middle wouldn't be able to get roofed up. I'd have to put a little piece of wall in the middle or a column, which is effectively the same. This will support more roof. But the nice thing about 13 by 13 when you're dragging it out or an 11 by 11 interior space is this is the biggest size you can build that will always be roofed. And it's a little bit lazy, but it's kind of convenient to make that your first room. This will give you enough space to do absolutely everything. It's also subdivides in a very sexy way. Right? If I do something like this, you know, I split this in half and all of a sudden both these places are kind of handy. I can even split it in half again and like, oh yeah, I get these nice little sizes and they all kind of work out. On the other hand, you might want to go with much prettier designs. You can go with any kind of shape you particularly care about. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start, actually, you know what? I will start like this. I'm going to make all the, these little sub rooms. We're going to figure out what we're going to do with them in a little bit. Now, whoever is assigned to construction, which is currently Phoebe, will go and help out here. I could turn on construction for Sky as well because she's quite good at it, but Sky's really busy. I don't want her to take any time to construct. She's got important stuff to do with all the plants. So right now we've got that. Now Vort isn't doing anything yet. They're just wandering around. They've got nothing to do. Fair enough. You know what I might do? So if we do have the ability to start crafting, they'll keep busy. Um, what I could do is I could designate a little bit of an area to mine. We've got some steel over here. We've got some compacted machinery in here. Uh, there's jade there. Uh, there might be some other things around the map as well. What I could do is I could go and say, listen, could you, could you mine this little area here? You know, just mine a little bit of that. And sky does have mining enabled right now, but I could turn off sky's mining and then Vort would just go and do this mining. I don't really need this stuff right now though. So what else can we do to keep Vort busy? Because they can't haul. 
Well, that's actually a little bit tricky. That's actually very tricky uh, for them, unfortunately. Maybe I will do the thing where I turn off Sky's Mining. And I'll just keep Vort busy by doing a little bit of mining. Uh, you can mine by clicking on a tile and clicking mine. You can also go into your orders menu here and mine out. We'll get a little bit of component over there. Here, we can mine those. And why don't you mine a little bit of steel that's over there? So Vort is going to wander. What I can do is I can draft them or recruit them and undraft them. It'll cause them to reevaluate their jobs immediately. So there you go. Vort has canceled their, they're just wandering and they're going to start doing a little bit of mining. Just going to keep them busy. Just, just so that they're technically doing something. There you go. Phoebe doing some nice construction over here. And yes, we do have a dog, Kiwi. The default start does start you off with a pet. Uh, it is random what your pet is. Now, Kiwi is a Yorkshire Terrier. They are not a terribly useful dog, uh, unfortunately. Um, they are too small to be able to haul things. This Yorkie is not very useful. They are bonded to Sky. Sky is going to be very happy that she is the master of the pet she's bonded with. So this is Sky's dog. And so Sky is really happy that she has a dog. That's great. If something happens to Kiwi, Sky's going to be very miserable. If Kiwi wasn't bonded to anyone, we might we might have we might have just butchered the dog since it wasn't very useful and we'd have had a little bit of fresh meat. Grimworld is a cruel 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 world. It's true. Okay, um I could mine out more components over here, but I think if I mine this out well, I guess there's a diagonal. We'd be protected. You know what? I'll go ahead and flag this area to be mine as well. That's going to be okay. Just keep them busy. That's going to be groovy. So we did start with some meals. We've got some survival meals over here, packaged survival meals. They have very long shelf life. They don't have to be refrigerated. They are deteriorating because they're outdoors. Most things that are outdoors, so we've got a flak vest over here. We've got some medicine over here. Most things that are outdoors will deteriorate. These chunks of slag or rock don't. Um, this is a pile of silver, which also doesn't deteriorate. And somewhere, oh yeah, we've got steel. Steel over here doesn't deteriorate either. So some things can be left outside. Other things need to be moved inside as kind of as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, it's such a shame that Vort can't haul, because this would be great busy work for Vort early on. I think I keep saying he, but it's a she. My bad, sorry to misgender you. Oh, are they all female? I thought Phoebe was, uh, was a guy. Wow, I'm terribly sorry. All my people are female over here. Okay. I'll have to remember that and use the correct pronouns here. So Phoebe is still working. So what the constructors will do is they will move things out of the way. Oh, Phoebe just got hungry. If we take a look at Phoebe's needs over here. So you see their food need over here is dropped below 30%. When a pawn's food need gets below 30%, they will go and try to get themselves some food. Everyone's probably getting about there in terms of hunger. 35%. So some people gain, get hungry at different rates. Um, depending on some of their stats and different things. Now on this needs page, you can also see if they're they're happy, right? We did see that with Sky, that they're happy because they're Kiwi's master. Phoebe, however, just got un uh, unhappy because she ate without a table, right? She just had to sit on the ground and eat her meal there. And you know, some people will call that a picnic, but some of us think that's completely uncivilized and not acceptable. And Phoebe is definitely one of those people. In fact, everyone in RimWorld does not like to eat without a table. We ultimately do want to keep people happy. On the needs thing, there's these little tick marks over here. These ticks represent if their mood gets below a certain point, they might have a mental break. Um, and depending on how low it is, these mental breaks can become more and more and more severe. Uh, you know, in the little minor area over here, the minor break risk, you know, they, they might just mope in the room for a little while. Whereas an extreme break risk, they might go out and decide they have to murder someone. Like they're that cranky. Now, different pawns, you'll see, will have these break th th thresholds in different places. Sky and Vort both have normal mental break threshold positions. But Phoebe, these thresholds are a lot higher, which means a, a, a mood that Vort and Sky would be perfectly happy with would be considered a very poor mood for Phoebe. Why is Phoebe like that? Because they are neurotic. Their mental break threshold is increased by 14%. They basically have to have 14 more points of positive mood to be in the same mood as everyone else. That, that, that is a really big problem. Phoebe is gonna have a lot of mental breaks, a lot more than everyone else. It's gonna be that much more important that we keep Phoebe as happy as possible. Now, when you start your colony, everyone's got this initial optimism and they have very low expectations. This is based on, I believe, the wealth of the colony. Everyone here knows the colony is poor, doesn't have a lot of going on, so they know they're not gonna get pampered right now and they're gonna just have to deal with it but that will change as things continue to improve. Now we can kick up the speed, which we will do. 
And we do get some notices over here like, hey, we don't have any colonist beds. And it is actually almost time to sleep. Now, we could go into furniture and we could build some beds, which takes wood, which we, again, we it says we don't have any storage, but we do have it. We could put those down there. Um, we could have made beds first. At least when they slept, they would sleep in a bed. Yeah, they'd sleep outside, but they'd be in a bed and that would help their mood. It's not critical. We can also just put down sleep spots. This is not furniture. This will say, listen, when you want to go sleep, just sleep here. Then they'll have slept on the ground, which they'll be unhappy about. But if we did quickly build a room, at least we could put them indoors. Right now, it doesn't really matter. I suppose what I'll do is I'll go and put down some beds. We will ultimately want to have everyone in their own personal bedroom because that will make them much happier. But for now, we're going to have to do this shared room over here. A bit of a barracks. And Feeb, what I'm going to do, I know you're going for a walk. And the reason they're doing that is because their recreation was a little bit lower and they just wanted to entertain themselves. But I'm going to tell Feeb, listen, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt your walk. Please go and prioritize making a wooden bed over here. We would like our people to maybe have a chance to sleep in a bed before nighttime. Ah, Feeb just botched this construction. When your construction skill is low, sometimes you will fail to construct something. It wastes some material and mostly wastes a lot of time is the concern. So it takes 45 wood to make a bed. There's only 23 of 45 in here. So Phoebe wasted half the wood trying to make this bed, which is really unfortunate. Yeah, material and time. I mean, we don't consider wood to be that costly, but the time investment is a big deal. The quality of the, the bed is also affected by the construction skill. So this is fine, it's just a normal bed. You can also do poor and awful, like it can be quite bad, or it can become like good or excellent, or even master work and legendary. You can really make some very fancy things as people get better. So it looks like we will have beds for everyone to sleep in. They will be sleeping outside because we don't have walls or a roof up here yet, but it's gonna be okay. Notice that even though Phoebe is not assigned to plant cut, in fact, is not not quote unquote allowed to plant cut, she is still cutting down this tree over here because it's in the way of her construction. So at least they will do that on their own, which is kind of nice. On the other hand, it's better if people with the actual skill do it because so Sky has skill working with plants. She will cut down trees faster and I believe get more wood out of it as well. So you can see how long it's taking Phoebe to cut down this tree, right? Sky, I think Sky's going to cut down two trees in the amount of time Phoebe is going to cut down this one. And that's because Sky is more skilled at plant work. And she's not even that good. She's only got a three, but it still makes a difference. There we go. It eventually did happen. And we got 33 wood out of it. Now everyone's going to go to sleep. The reason they're going to sleep right now is there is a sleep schedule. Pawns will go to sleep automatically when they get too tired, but you can always also set a schedule. Now, by default, it does flag them to sleep for eight hours. There's no need to do that. Um, what you can do... In fact, you don't have to have a sleep schedule at all. You can put them on anything over here, in which case they'll just go to bed when they're tired. I kind of like having everyone go to bed at the same time. There's a few different reasons why it can be helpful to do that. Not really anything worth talking about um, right now, uh, but if nothing else, it just feels right. Uh, pawns don't really, your normal pawns don't get upset being awake at night, although they do get a debuff if they spend too much time in the dark. Therefore, if they're gonna be doing, you know, most stuff, especially outdoor stuff, it makes sense to put them to sleep at night because then they won't get the darkness debuff. Some pawns will have the night owl trait. Night owls do not like to be awake during the day, so you're going to want to explicitly set them to have a schedule they sleep during the day. Ancient danger. So when you set up your map, there will be these areas that are walled off. And the first time one of your people gets near it, you'll get this note about ancient danger. There is something horrible and dangerous inside of this. If we were to go and deconstruct one of these walls and pop this open, there's a very good chance horrible things would happen to us. We are not ready to deal with that. So this is just the game telling us, hey, don't pop this open. Don't deconstruct these walls or whatever. What I like to do is I like to go into my orders here. There's a planning tool, which just lets you draw arbitrary stuff. I like to put like a D marker on places to remind myself, oh yes, this is dangerous. There we go. Or, you know, you can draw an X or something like that. That's pretty handy. Um, there's sometimes more than one. And yeah, you can you can tell because you'll be able to find walls. Uh, we might only have the one on this map. But yeah, I knew from the start this was going to be a danger zone. Because when you see construction constructed walls that are you know, all enclosed like that, that's almost certainly the case. Some of your maps will also have various ruins. They might have little bits of walls up and around. Uh, I think actually I'm, I'm thinking uh, mostly with the expansions, especially with ideology. There'll be a lot of extra like little wall bits and debris and things all over the map. Uh, so there'll be more doodads depending on the expansions. 
But there we go. Yeah, we don't want to pop that open. Anyway, we are 43 minutes into this video. It's definitely time to put a cut in this bad boy. Uh, hope you enjoy this Let's Play slash tutorial that we've got going on. Um, I usually play uh, RimWorld heavily modded, so it's actually quite fun to go to a vanilla run once again to experience what that's like. You know, mods, mods are great. RimWorld has an incredible, unbelievable modding community with so many mods that some people are like, I can't play RimWorld without it. And that's just, that's just testament not to say, it's not to say that there's something that's missing in RimWorld. It's a testament to how amazing and incredible the modding community is, uh, how great they are. But the fact of the matter is the RimWorld base vanilla game is great on its own too. And kind of is, just feels like a different game. Once you've played a lot of modded RimWorld, going back to vanilla feels like a fresh and brand new game in a weird way with a different set of challenges, which is excellent. And I'm looking forward to this. And I hope you are going to enjoy this as well. Thanks for watching folks. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.